Hey everybody, I am Taylor and I'm the Stargate Guy, where I talk to you about everything and anything Stargate. So this video is a short version of the live stream conversation that we had. The live streams are the first Sunday of every month at 10 a.m. Pacific time in the U.S. So here's just the theory that we were talking about, as well as a few of the comments relating to the theory. You can get the entire thing at a link at the end of this video. Hope you enjoy. Uh, the question of the day was Ra on Asgard. Now, obviously, Ra the Guawood was not, strictly speaking, a Asgard per se. But, let's get into this. Because I theorized that he was an Asgard. Now, in order to uh, go into this, we need to remind ourselves about uh, the nature of the Guawood and how the Guawood operate. So, the Guawood are a parasitic race of uh, snake-like beings that burrow into a host body and gain possession and control of that host body. And when that kind of blending occurs, the word that the Tokra uses, when a blending occurs, then the Guawood that is possessing its host can gain access to the knowledge uh, and the experience of their host. Okay? So... Uh, the difficulty is, though, is that a host can fight back. As we see with Skara, uh, Skara is a prime example. Skara had a very strong mind, and he pushed back against the Goa'uld Chlorel in order to try to gain repossession of his body. Sharae was another one, okay? So the host can fight back. And two, Dustin, thank you so much. You're awesome, man. Uh, Dustin Beer, $10 super chat. Take my money, damn it. I will. I will take your money. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, for those of you who are not aware, uh, there are, are there's a way for you to donate to help keep the channel going on the Super Chat. There's a little dollar sign underneath the comment box, and you can go there and you can type in whatever amount you want and a comment, and I will definitely see it, and they're all greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Back on track. Wait, where was I? Oh, yeah. Back on track. The host can fight back. Okay? So, that poses some risk to the Guawood symbiote who is taking control of the body, all right? Uh, Chlorel wanted to spend more time in the sarcophagus in Season 2, Episode 1, The Serpent's Lair, uh, when Scar was really fighting back at him and, and, you know, helping him to, like, not raise the shield quite in time. Well, he did. But uh, Chlorel was saying that he wanted to spend more time in the sarcophagus so that he can gain more control of Scar. okay? So the host can fight back posing damage potentially to the Guawood symbiote. So, this comes back to um, the Guawood, who have the Guawood taken as hosts. Now, on the Guawood's home planet, we know that there is a race of species, uh, a race of species, that's weird, that there is a species, <coughs> blame it on me being sick, that there is a species called Unas. Now, the Unas are reptilian-like species, that they're very strong, okay, and that um, the Guawood can take possession of the Unas. And as we know from Tilk, and as well as from the episode, you know, Thor's Hammer. And uh, the one where, you know, Tilk is thought of being a witch. Um, I don't want to say too much because it's spoilers for her back there. But anyway, um, that the Unas were the first species that the Guawood would take possession of. Which makes sense because they developed on the same planet. Now... The Guawood can take possession of other types of beings, such as humans. Now, although the success rate in taking a human is not guaranteed 100%, hence the need for Jaffa. Jaffa with, you know, the little pouch incubators where they put the Guawood symbiote in it. Uh, that helps the symbiote to have more of a higher success rate uh, when when taking over a human host. Am, am I making any sense? Or, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that this is making logical sense. My line of thought here. If it doesn't, I blame it on being sick. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be my crutch for today, by the way. So, uh, the Guawood can take possession of other species, not just Unas and humans. Okay, Although, that that could pose potential damage to the Guawood symbiote if it tries to inhabit another type of being um, due to species compatibility as well as to the uh, strength of the host's mind. Okay, so next going on to the Asgard. We know that the Asgard uh, have been at uh, kind of war with 
the Goa world going back who knows how long, okay? But that eventually they formed a treaty, um, kind of like an armistice agreement, where the Asgard have control of some planets, the protected planets, and the Goa world can kind of like pillage and plunder and do whatever they want with the rest of the galaxy, uh, as long as they don't cross the line and come over into the protected planets. And when they do, then the Asgard can totally come in and kick their ass and, you know, beat them out of the out of the solar system. But that treaty was not always in place. So, uh, before treaties are in place, there's usually a wonderful thing called a war, where two parties are trying to, like, kill each other, right? So the Gould and the Asgard were at war before they created this treaty. So, uh... Being at war with a intergalactic species, it would make logical sense for the Gua'uld to try to get as much intel about them and their technology as possible. The Gua'uld being parasitic races in nature, they like to get other people's technology and knowledge for their own and kind of co-opt it and make it their own in order to be like better and uh, more godlike. Okay, so they claim the gate system was their own even though it wasn't. They, uh, you know, potentially, we don't know for sure, but they potentially took uh, the hot talk from a different species um, and made it their own, okay? That's what they do. So, I theorize that Ra, the Gua'uld, before coming to Earth, found a way to capture an Asgard enemy. And as an attempt, a risky attempt, to get knowledge of Asgard technology, to get knowledge of Asgard strategy in the war, to get knowledge of the Asgard as a whole, their strengths, their weaknesses, Ra implanted himself into the Asgard that he captured. Now, the Asgard that he captured would naturally be strapped to um, a board or a bed or something where he could not, you know, get away and or get up and run around, right? So, Ra implanted himself into this Asgard in the hope of getting this Asgard technology and knowledge and all this goodness. But, the Asgard fought back. With the strength of mind of the Asgard versus Ra, um, I theorize that Ra uh, was getting severely damaged by this blend and that he was becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. And uh, while this blend was happening, he was in charge of this Hatak, or of this ship. And he ordered the ship to fly off into space. That was kind of unknown to the Goa'uld for safety reasons while he's attempting this very risky thing. And <clears throat> so while uh, they were flying in this unknown region, they stumbled upon Earth. And they found the species. And they beamed, or they, you know, ringed up. Uh, a member of the species and found out that they would be very compatible with the Gua'uld and that their bodies are very easy to repair. Human bodies. So, Ra, when he was strong enough to leave one host and enter into another, he chose to leave that Asgard that he was trying to get knowledge from into the human host to recover and to gain his strength and as that, you know, enter into that new host. So, the question then becomes... Why do we not see a bunch of Asgard technology or knowledge being gained by the Gua'uld over the past 10,000 years at the point where Ra would have done this thing? And the answer really comes down to the strength of the Asgard mind. We know that the Asgard might be very narrow in their thinking, but they are very intelligent beings and that they do have a strong mental prowess. So, the Asgard uh, that was... Uh, being a host to Ra temporarily, I theorize put up enough of a fight to stave off Ra, and he might have given Ra some strategic knowledge of the battle that was going on, but no technological knowledge. And Ra, having gained that strategic knowledge, not only did he find the humans and was able to do that, but using that strategical knowledge of what was going on at the time with the Battle of the Asgard and the Goa'uld, he was able to use that knowledge in order to uh, gain more control and hence become the most powerful Goa'uld system lord uh, out of the bunch of them. He used that expert knowledge that only he would know from attempting this very risky blending in order to win uh, a couple of battles during the war and set himself up to be the most powerful Goa'uld out of all the system lords. So... 
that's kind of my thinking there. That's kind of the basic strategy of how Raw was an Asgard at a time, not always. And that would explain why in the original movie, we have an Asgard-like being seen on screen. And that would explain technically that um, why they were in the narration and stuff that Daniel Jackson was giving when they came to Earth, that uh, the species was a dying race. Well, the Asgard are a dying race. They cannot really reproduce, and they already set themselves way down the path of having the genetic degradation and disease that would eventually wipe out their entire species. So they would technically be a dying race. They just didn't realize it 10,000 years ago. Okay? So that part of Daniel Jackson's narrative would be true. Also, the visual on the uh, inside wall of the Stargate movie and... and um, as well as the scenes that we see of this alien species look vaguely Asgard. As we know, the Asgard has changed shape and form over at least the past 30,000 years. 30,000 years ago, we see an Asgard host look more like us. They were a lot taller. They were able to sexually reproduce. Their heads were um, more kind of human-like shaped, except kind of bulging at the top and at the back. Whereas the Asgards now, they're a lot shorter, they're a lot skinnier, they're more frail, but they still have the same cognitive uh, brain capacity. So the Asgard that we see within the Stargate movie is kind of a half step between the uh, Asgard 30,000 years ago and the Asgard today. It's kind of a mix. It is not as short as the Asgard today. The brain is not as weird, bulbous looking as the Asgard today, but more so than the one 30,000 years ago. It seems, looking at the pictures, and I wish on a live stream that I could show you guys the pictures to help, you know, make my argument. Um, but it seems like a good half step there. So, uh, that really comes down to the end of the movie, when the nuke goes off, and we see the Asgard-like being inside of the human-like being. Or inside the human. We know it's a human-like being. It's just human. Well, that comes down in my... Uh, theory, that comes down to just plain storytelling. Because if you look at the actual scene and you freeze frame it, the Asgard-like being cannot, yes, this is live, the Asgard-like being uh, cannot fit inside of, a, of the human. If you freeze frame it, just if you just consider the head of the Asgard, it will not be able to fit inside of a human skull. It wouldn't happen. Okay, it, it doesn't fit into there. I mean, it's not a freaking TARDIS. It's, it's not bigger on the inside. Okay, it's a finite amount of space. So, it doesn't really make sense. Just looking at the head, looking at the rest of the body, I mean, what? You, you, the Asgard have exactly, exactly the length of limbs to fit inside of the human arm to have control of the fingers? No, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It's symbolic. In storytelling, it was just a symbolic thing by the director and the producers of showing that this being was inside the human. Because literally speaking, it would not fit. Okay? So that explosion, it kind of sees the past life because when you die, theoretically, you're supposed to like have flashbacks to your pre to your life. Okay? And have it be like, I don't know, a thing. Um, I don't know. I almost drowned twice and I didn't really have that too much. But anyway. Um, but yeah, so it was more of an, an aesthetic artist choice rather than a actual literal one. Because the actual literal one doesn't work. It, it doesn't fit. Okay? So that's my theory as to how Ra was in Asgard. How Ra gained as much power as he did using that Asgard knowledge to help set himself up in the war to be better uh, than the other Goa'uld. As well as the finding of the human race uh, would also greatly help set him up in that regard to being the most powerful Gwawold uh, system lord out there. Um, so anyway, that's that's my basic thought. There's probably one or two more points that I can't remember right now because, you know, sick. Um, <laughs> I'm using that as my crutch. So uh, let's go to the comments here and let's see what you guys think about this theory. And um, then we'll go into kind of a QA, and a have fun, you know, BS around kind of, kind of thing. Alrighty. So, man, there's a lot of comments here already. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Hey, Fred, how you doing? Um, uh, War Dog 99 can see you and future Miss Stargate Woman. 
You're on camera, by the way. Yeah. Um, There's nowhere else to sit. Well, yeah, yeah. That's, you only have one couch. I only have one couch, yes, <laughs> and it's like directly behind me. Uh, it's the part of working for the government as a social worker. You don't have a lot of money for more couches. <laughs> um, Mad Dragon, damn it, why can't you stream later? And I'm working until 8 p.m. British time. Oh, dude, I'm sorry. Um, unfortunately, you can come back later and watch the live stream whenever you want. I mean, that's a positive thing, I guess. Um, let's see here. Coffee is an Asgard. Yo, glad to meet you. Little? Hello, Little. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Marcus, uh, sounds like an interesting theory. Thank you. Uh, Fred Gilliam, my question is, how was Ra able to get uh, the best of an Asgard enough to possess him? Well, <clears throat> that's a really tricky part. Um, because really it is, it is intentionally trying to capture an Asgard, which... I don't know, it's, it's possible, it's possible. Um, I mean, you could uh, take over, you could try to penetrate the ship and try to capture an Asgard and take it out in a cargo ship. Um, you could try to intercept a smaller Asgard spacecraft when it was going to another planet. Um, you could try to do a kind of kidnap operation where you grab some, at that point it would be Unas, um, and they kind of break into a ship and they kind of like steal an Asgard and bring him back. I mean, as far as exactly how did he capture it in the first place, I'm not sure. It is theoretically possible, though. The Asgard are not all powerful beings that cannot be captured. I mean, come on. They're not perfect. And that's what I was pointing out with the, you know, um, their idiots video is that they're not perfect. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Cohen Gagan, I've always wondered, do the Jaffa naturally have a pouch or are they engineered? As we see in the episode Hathor, um, Hathor being a queen, uh, that there is the technology to, uh, modify the human DNA to create the symbiote pouch, uh, as we see her try with Jack. So, that goes into a little bit of another theory. Uh, according to Tilk on Dakara, that is where the Guawold gave the Jaffa their uh, lasting uh, strength and virility. And uh, so I theorize that that technology that can modify um, a, a human DNA, that if that is not treated right away, then it can become permanent and it is inheritable. So if they... Uh, if the, if the Goa world got enough human together and they modified their DNA to become the Jaffa with the little pouch and they have babies and babies and babies and babies and babies, then that DNA, that trait passes on. So they're essentially human with just a small alteration to incorporate the biological need for a symbiote pouch and that reliance upon the Goa world symbiote as a immune system. So I hope that answers your question. Um, Dragonwear44, Kendra from Thor's Hammer had the most influence over her snake than other hosts. That is very true. She had a very uh, stronger mind than most hosts. Uh, Takurus Davis, I heard this theory before and I agree. I am curious about your take on it. Um, you've heard my take on it. <laughs> this, this theory, um, was actually the very first video that I ever shot about Stargate. On my original channel, uh, Beard vs. Geek, uh, was Raw and Asgard, the first video I ever made. So I wanted to bring it over to this channel, um, but I didn't know how, so I used to live stream as a, as a cool workaround. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Kevin Tran, this is a totally different question and topic, but Stargate guy, at the beginning of Atlantis, why didn't the expedition pack Zat guns as part of their sidearms? They're scientists. I don't know. The military personnel were more comfortable with the 9mm than they were with the Zap. Um, as well as they didn't know exactly what they were getting into. So having the ability to send things is not always helpful than just killing it. Uh, plus, it's a little redundant because going story-wise, you know, as the writers and everything looking forward, all of the Wraith weapons are stunner weapons anyway. So having a Zat kind of like defeats the purpose of taking over the Wraith weapons and incorporating that in. Um, so that could, I don't know, that could be it. Silent Killer, hey, what's up? 
Um, pork chops. Wasn't Tilt Sun on his way to getting the belly hole for his worm, uh, Buddy Butt? Buddy Butt? Um, so he was about to have the symbiote input into him. Uh, Ryak was born with a symbiote pouch. But it was, they as a kid, your immune system kind of sticks with yourself until you like start to get into like puberty and like maturity and then your immune system starts to diminish and you need a symbiote at that time so yes you're born with a pouch uh but you don't actually need the symbiote until you're a little bit more mature um that's part of the body changes you know with hormones that kind of thing you know i'm not going to get in there um or read a read a book about that um (laughs) anyway this is in health class (laughs) I'll leave it at that. Um, Destin Beard, season one, episode 14. Hathor confirms that. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, Brain Shredder, I disagree, if only due to sloppy writing. Genetic memory means the son of Ra uh, should have had knowledge of the Asgard if this was the case, but Herer didn't. So, very good point. Um, I theorize that Ra's children, uh, was pre-discovery of humans, okay? So, therefore, pre-assimilation of Asgard, all right? Because, going back at ancient Egyptian archaeology, you had Ra, Hathor, Heru, Anut, all of these other, you know, Egyptian deities, all showing up in the archaeological record at the same time. There wasn't a big gap in between Ra showing up and then everyone else showing up. They all happened around the same time. Um, therefore, Ra would have had, you know, his wonderful Gua Wood babies uh, with the queen uh, pre-coming to Earth. And then everyone else kind of came to Earth, which would also explain why Ra uh, didn't just flat out kill the other Gua Wood and why so many Gua Wood were in ancient Egypt because Ra, you know, the father god, um, had, you know, the babies that were heroin and, you know, all this other stuff, um, and wonderful, you know, incest stories of mythology. Um, and that's why, you know, we have so many gold in one location because they were all related. They all had rise as a father and therefore he allowed them to come and take human hosts and take them away from earth to populate their own other worlds as long as he was in charge. Uh, you know, power play there. So anyway, that's, that's my two bits on it. I don't know if that makes sense. I have a fever, so it might not make sense. <laughs> uh, Runner of the Moose, Ra was the first Asgard slash Gold, hence the monopoly on advanced technology. The original Asgard was just the scout checking out to see the Gold Unus uh, uh, homeworld. Yeah, good idea. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh... Fred Gilliam, maybe he did, uh, but it probably was thousands of years ago. So Ra obtained less advanced Asgard technology. Yeah, so this was like 10,000 years ago. The Asgard would have uh, developed more in 10,000 years. They don't, they aren't just stagnant. Uh, so yeah, that's a good thing to keep in mind. This was 10,000 years ago and technology and Asgard changed, you know. Do-do-do-do-do. Uh, Ah, whoa, it flipped out. What happened there? Uh, man, I am so behind in the comments. Um, uh, Dragonware44, if he transformed from an Asgard body to a human one, uh, then when then when Rod died, he didn't turn into Asgard uh, as he died. No. Um, well, I think you asked this before I, I, I went into it. But yeah, that was... Uh, that was more of a storytelling device kind of thing. It was more of a symbolic kind of thing rather than a literal interpretation. Uh, yeah. Um, Run of the Moose, I'd class this as canon. Thank you. There you go. That's, that would be like a really cool for me is if my theories uh, got turned into canon later on down the road. I think that'd be cool. Um, anyway. Um, Midor Ibishi, Midor Ibishi, I, I don't know how to say her name, 
Uh, that theory is more or less in line with what I've been thinking. Thank you. Happy to help. Um, it's plausible. Thank you, Silent Killer. Um, John Peters, a woman who loves to watch Stargate. I think he means you. Yep. I do. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stargate woman, I think Stargate gal works better. I think Stargate gal works better, too. Yeah. So you have the Stargate guy and you have the Stargate gal. Yeah. Two G's. Yeah, two G's. Two G's. Two G's. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not... I'm, I'm so, uh, yeah, I don't know what gangster or I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm from Oregon, man. I don't, I don't deal with gangsters. Um, <laughs> we're getting off track. <laughs> 2 G. 2 G. War Dog 99, I like your thoughts. Uh, but then I have a problem with it by all means. Uh, if his objective was to blend with an Asgard, why did Ra not use a queen to make the transfer more successful? Uh, it would have taken more time, and, you know, if you're in the middle of a war, you want as much intelligence as you possibly can, uh, as quickly as you can get it. So he was willing to take the risk to himself in order to potentially become the most powerful gold in the galaxy, and it worked out well for him. That's my thoughts, anyway. Uh, do 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 uh, where the whole point of using the queen is to gather DNA for a future host and make them more compatible. Yeah. So it would have taken more time. Joe Seisler. Uh, if it was far enough back, it's possible that the Asgard didn't know that the Gould were a threat and maybe even approached them as allies and Ra tricked and betrayed one. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Uh, wait, the pouch is genetic? Yeah, that's my theory anyway. The pouch is genetic for Jaffa. Uh, Sean Meyer, sounds good. Could Raw have gained a little bit of tech knowledge? Maybe. Yeah. But as far as uh, Stargate, or is it not Stargate, as far as Asgard knowledge that we see currently in relation to the Gua Wu technology currently, there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, overlap. Or, so, I don't know if he actually got tech specs, uh, just because there's not really a lot of overlap nowadays. But, I don't know, it's theoretically possible. Uh. Hmm, T. Um, well, it jumped again. Um, Sci-Fi Sith Dan, hello there, the Stargate guy. Hello. Uh, decaffeinated or caffeinated? Uh, uh, T. No, no caffeine in that one. No caffeine in this one? Not that one. Okay, no caffeine. Yeah, it's um, lemon... No, that's peppermint. That's peppermint, yeah. Apparently I can't taste anything. It's peppermint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeffrey Nahas, is Ra older than you? If so, why did he not suffer from senile illness? Because we blew Ra up. Ra got, you know, Boom. And it wasn't until like 15 years later that you started to show the signs of, of senile illness. So, I guess if we blew up you too, yeah, if we blew up you too. Anyway, uh, sorry, pictured a completely different thing. Uh, but yeah, we we blew up raw before you, so he didn't have to deal with senileness. Senileness is that a word? Senileness. Senility. Sen senility. Senility. I don't know. I don't know. I've heard it both ways. I've heard it both ways. <laughs> see what I got put up with? Uh, uh, let's see here. And uh, Java Bean said, good point. Uh, wasn't you, senility, uh, come from overuse of the sarcophagus? Yes, that does play a huge role in it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Emiliano Bar Baroni. Em Emiliano Baroni. I take it that's Italian. Uh, why did Earth symbol on the Stargate change? Why did Earth symbol on the Stargate change? And why is it a pyramid? Okay. So David and Reed, uh, who founded Gate World and is now working for MGM over at StargateCommand.co, um, we talked about this a little bit uh, at WonderCon this past weekend. And that, you know, one of his bigger things. At least I think it was. Was it David Reed? No, it wasn't David Reed. Although we did talk about something else about the story. It was, uh, it was Will. 
Will on the Stargate uh, Super Saiyan panel. Um, he was talking about how uh, when the so the the gate that had the pyramid and the little sun over it, that gate uh, blew up, okay, uh, due to Anubis, okay, when season six with Jonas and they took it into the atmosphere and right, and then they got the gate that they found in Antarctica and put over it. Well, the Antarctic gate had a symbol that was a big circle with a little line under it. But yet, after season six, when the original gate blew up, okay, the symbol was not the big circle with the little line. It was back to the pyramid with the little circle over it. So, as a continuity thing, um, I guess, as a continuity thing and a branding thing, the show kind of glossed over the fact that although we changed gates, the symbols remained the same. So, I, I don't know, there's, there's something that he was complaining about and I completely understand, but. I don't know if that's what you were asking about, but I don't know. 